Hello and welcome to the ArtsLink Assembly 2021 Future Fellows. Uh, we're speaking to you directly from Lenape Hoking, which is the unceded land of the Lenape people. And we wish to pay our respects to the elders of, and the indigenous uh, population, both past, present and future, on whose land we are now occupying. As you know, the ArtsLink Assembly is our annual meeting of transnational artists, uh, curators and arts workers. And for this session, we're delighted to partner with the Virilist Center for Art and Politics. And Karin uh, Kourney, the director of the Virilist Center, will introduce this session in an extended format. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, and thank you all very much for joining us. Um, I do want to take a few minutes and just give you a bit of background about the Virilis Center, the Boris Lori Foundation Fellows, and the program this afternoon. But I do want to start by thanking Simon and CEC Arts Link very much for the partnership. It's also been lovely and delightful to partner with the team at CEC Arts Link, in particular Maxime Tumenev, uh, the program's manager. Um, as we know in these times, um, it's both uh, been challenging and also incredibly necessary to develop and deepen the um, uh, partnership collaborations that uh, are, we are able to celebrate with this particular program this afternoon. And um, it's been wonderful and rewarding to partner with CEC Arts Link and us, the Verilis Center for Art and Politics, a platform for public scholarship at the New School on this program this afternoon. We've partnered with CC Arts Link before. Um, we were lucky to host one of the fellows, Fatim Farhad, about two years ago. And this afternoon, we are really delighted to present you, etc., the Verily Center's Boris Lori Fellows, who will follow the distinguished cohort of um, Arts Link's future fellows and I suspect we'll add a note of exuberance to proceedings that are both very serious and very urgent. Before they present Responsibility, a manifesto on ecocide, let me share a word about the Boris Lori Fellowship, because I think it matters to the discussions that we've had over the last few days here, and I will then introduce all the speakers. The Boris Lori Fellowship supports an artist or a group of artists whose approach to art making is distinct because they are fearless and bold. They are internationally committed and globally engaged. They situate themselves independently of the for-profit art world and they have overcome political hardship. These were all qualities that distinguished the work of Boris Lori, who passed away in 2008 was a Holocaust survivor and the founder of the No Art Movement in New York City. They are also qualities that we've witnessed in many of the ArtsLink Future Fellows. Um, but a fellowship that is named in honor of another artist also speaks of a historical lineage of artists or for artists. And that work is uh, building on, uh, and it acknowledges the work um, that we do and the fact that we are building on foundations that were laid by others before us. That kind of historical awareness that recognizes ancestors in order to break away from them distinguishes again many of the artists we've heard from earlier, but perhaps um, none more so than etc. the inaugural Boris Lori Fellows at the Verilis Center. Um, a word on etc. The group was formed in 1997 in Buenos Aires. It is a multidisciplinary collective composed of visual artists, poets, and performance artists. And it has been led since 2007 by co-founders Loreto Garin Guzman and Federico Zuckerfeld. And we'll hear from them in a moment. In 2005, they were also co-founders of the International Errorist Movement, a global organization that pro proclaims error um, as a philosophy of life, and we'll return to that as well. They have participated in numerous exhibitions and biennials throughout the world, such as the biennials of Jakarta, Sao Paulo, Athens, Istanbul, and Taipei, and their work has been recognized, among others, by the Prince Klaus Fund for its denouncement of human rights and environmental abuses 
through theatrical and poetic actions often exercised at great uh, political and personal risk. Under the heading Neo-Extractivism, Protocols of Buen Vivir, Loreto Guzman and Federico Zuckerfeld divided their four-semester uh, Boisuri Fellowship into four chapters, and we're thrilled to present to you now chapter two, entitled Response, Ability, a Manifesto on Ecocide. Like the previous chapters, it is based on the indigenous concept of Buen Vivir, collecting existing and creating new protocols to protect the environment today, this afternoon, with a particular focus on the notion of ecocide. Ecocide, as um, you may know, refers to the mass damage and destruction of entire ecosystems. We will begin this afternoon with a presentation by Jay Bernstein, the University Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the New School for Social Research, who has in recent years focused some of his scholarship on ecocide and is actually about to finish um, a manuscript for a new book entitled Of Ecocide and Human Rights. Bernstein is an expert in continental philosophy and a leading interpreter of the philosophy of Adorno. He's a co-editor of the journal Critical Horizon and has published numerous books leading up to the one I just mentioned, among them the philosophy of the novel Lukács, Marxism and the Dialectics of Form, Recovering Ethical Life, Jürgen Habermas and the Future of Critical Theory, and the fate of art, aesthetic alienation from Kant to Derrida to Adorno. And um, I'm just quoting or reading a very brief excerpt from uh, Professor Bernstein's faculty page on the New School website, where he says, quote, philosophy for me means interrogating the foundations of our life together, how we make sense of the world and how we fail how philosophy profiles the human as upright and as failing, as knowing and as blinded, as world-making and as suffering, as flourishing and as dying, and how those competing images are bound together in our morals, uh, politics, ordinary life, and art." End of quote. After Professor Bernstein's expose, we'll hear from etc in an exchange with performance artist and scholar Larry Bogat, who specializes in humor, imagination, and theatrics in progressive movement activism. A professor of political performance at the University of California, Davis, and a co-founder of the clandestine insurgent rebel clown army, Professor Bogat also is the author of several books, um, and among them are Electoral Guerrilla Theatre, Radical Ridicule and Social Movements, Tactical Performance, The Theory and Practice of Serious Play, and Performing Truth, Works of Radical Memory for Times of Social Amnesia. Professor Bogart is the recipient of a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. He was also the Art and Controversy Fellow at Carnegie Mellon, as well as the Humanities and Political Conflict Fellow at Arizona State University, and has performed and led workshops in mischievous activist pranks internationally, most recently in Brazil, Chile, Latvia, Spain, and of course, um, Argentina. Um, I'd like to thank the funders for the Boris Lurie Fellowship. They are the Boris Lurie Art Foundation, as well as the Shana and Josefina Luria Memorial Foundation. Our work at the Verley Centre is also made possible by the board of the Verley Centre and the New School, as well as by our tremendously resourceful and accomplished staff. And I'd like to um, single out curator Ariel Lapira, who has really been instrumental in organizing this event this afternoon. But our indebtedness goes further. At this point, I'd also like to acknowledge, following Simon's lead, that in New York, in this lovely room, floating high above Rockefeller Center in Manhattan, we are, in fact, meeting on land that is not ours, but unceded territory of the Lenape people and other indigenous peoples. Bearing this debt in mind, I think will be helpful as we now listen to etc. and their proposals for when Vivir, First, um, however, um, I welcome um, Jay Bernstein and look forward to his talk.
Thank you, Karen. Thank you for inviting me. I am more than honored to be performing with etc. They share my passion for the problem of ecocide and the need for us to think together about it. So what I want to do in, in uh, my small talk is introduce you to the concept of ecocide. Some of the background, some of the ways in which it has been formed. Ecocide is mass damage and destruction of ecosystems, severe harm to nature, which is widespread or long term. Now, rather remarkably, and fitting for this occasion, in June of this year, a panel of 12 lawyers from around the world, sponsored by the Stop Ecocide Foundation, proposed a new definition of ecocide as a fifth crime against peace. We should think of this proposal as a response to what has happened at the Glasgow Climate Summit. Nothing. I want to quote and quote accurately Greta Thunberg. What has happened is blah, blah, blah. You recall, of course, after documenting that carbon emissions are on the track to rise by 16% by 2030, according to the UN, and rather than fall by half, which is the cut needed to keep global heating uh, under the international agreed limit of 1.5 degrees centigrade, Thunberg said, build back better, blah, blah, blah. Green economy, blah, blah, blah. Net zero by 2050, blah, blah, blah. She said all this in Milan about a month ago. This is all, she said, we hear from our so-called leaders. Words that sound great, but so far have not led to action. Our hopes and ambitions drown in their empty promises. The notion of ecocide is meant to be action rather than the promises of statesmen. <clears throat> the idea of adding it to the crimes against peace would be to say that it would become one of the core international crimes. They now are genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, the crime of aggression. Those crimes are ones dealt with by the International Criminal Court. And you should know, by the way, that the Criminal Court has only been functioning since 2002, which is to say the very idea of international crime of a serious kind is still new still being born. Here, and I want, it's only 168 words, is the new proposal, and we deserve to hear it in its full. For the purpose of this statute, ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. And because these are lawyers talking to other lawyers and judges, they go ahead and define all their terms. For our purposes, just the first two will do. It is rare that one hears the word wanton in a legal setting. But wanton is what's at stake here. Wanton means with reckless disregard for damage, which would be clearly excessive in relation to the social and economic benefits anticipated. That means we're talking about anticipation, proportion. What's happening to the earth is out of all proportion and severe 
means damage which involves very serious adverse changes, disruption, or harm to any, any element of the environment, including grave impacts on human life or natural, cultural, or economic resources. Where did this concept come from? Where did the idea of ecocide come from? In fact, it emerged out of the war in Vietnam. The United States was trying to get rid of the Viet Cong, and they could not find them. They were hiding in the forests and jungles. So what did the United States do? Blew away the jungles, flattened them. Ecocide was a military tactic using Agent Orange and blanket bombing, more than 12% of Vietnam's land area was decimated. In response to this horror, a group of scientists at Yale, led by Arthur Goldspin, proposed a new idea, the idea of ecocide. And as far as we know, Goldspin coined the term. This is his words as he was announcing this at a meeting. After the end of World War II, and as a result of the Nuremberg trials, we justly condemned willful destruction of an entire people and its culture, calling this crime against humanity genocide. So genocide is the model. It seems to me that the willful and permanent destruction of environment in which a people can live in a manner of their own choosing ought similarly to be considered as a crime against humanity, to be designated by the term ecocide. I believe, this is still Goldston, 1970, that the most highly developed nations have already committed auto-ecocide. I'll come back to that in a moment. Over large parts of their own countries, at the present time, the United States stands alone as possibly having committed ecocide against another country, Vietnam, through its massive use of chemical defoliants and herbicides. The United Nations would appear to be an appropriate body for the formulation of a proposal against ecocide. In referring to autoecocide, Goldstein was in fact referring to Rachel Carson's claim that the use of pesticides in the United States should be called biocide, the killing of life. What Goldstein did not anticipate, he thought there was a military reason for banning ecocide, what he did not know at the time was that there would be ever new forms of auto-ecocide, of what etc. uses as the term terracide, that have become industrial capitalist form of life over the last 50 years. So I want to make a proposal about the nature of why there should be an ecocide convention now. And here is the almost irresistible hypothesis. Liberal capitalism has become an ecocidal, a terracidal form of life. Now, that's a huge claim. It's a huge claim to claim that, that our form of life is ecocidal. And in order to give you some sense of how this comes about, why I am making this immense claim that there should not be a narrow law, that this is a, a critique of a form of life, we need, as we often do in understanding things, to put in some background. 
And indeed, we need to, to say that there is a tale that, like all good stories, begins a long, long time ago. And like all good stories, it begins once upon a time. Well, once upon a time, and I can actually give you a date, 11,700 years ago, a new geological epoch arrived. The Holocene, the new whole. And the Holocene was remarkable because before it, the Pleistocene, it was disaster for everyone, ice ages and then warming, then ice ages. Nothing good could happen in the Pleistocene. But suddenly, the Holocene brought a temperate climate, a moderately warm and relatively stable set of climate conditions that enabled the biosphere, enabled living nature, and its ecosystems to develop these resilient forms of flourishing. And when this happened, suddenly human beings thought, hey, we don't have to chase the animals, we don't have to chase the weather, we can sit still. We can farm. So the Holocene's moderate conditions enabled human living to be transformed from hunting and gathering to agriculture. And agriculture, this is kind of surprising, but it begins really only about 8,000 years ago. It's really relatively recent that we settle down. And of course, this involved the domestication of plants and animals, and it really takes off. Agriculture leads to the emergence of cities. Suddenly you can feed people who don't have to raise their own food and all the accomplishments of civilization. So here's the first thing I want to underline, that all of human civilization is or has been Holocene civilization. That is the Holocene that made it possible. So that we misunderstand everything that is deep and important about human civilization if we do not understand how it has been dependent on this bounteous munificence of nature, nature's continual power of procreation that we in the global north have taken for granted, we misunderstand everything if we think that's what nature is. It's not what nature is. It's a small time slice of nature a little bit of nature that began just a few thousand years ago, 11,700 if you're counting, which is to say everything we have taken for granted is about historical nature. Nature is not eternal, it's historical. And historical nature is the Holocene, and that is what we have destroyed. The cost of progress has been immense. And we see it beginning in the Industrial Age. That's a picture of Manchester, already invisible in the mist. And then things really change at the moment. And again, we give a date to it. This is the date of the beginning of the Anthropocene. It's 1950. And if you look at this series of charts, they have what is called the shape of a hockey stick. That is, level for a long time, and then it zips up. And everything arises at the same moment, in 1950. So what happens in 1950 is that world population grows, but so does industry, paper production, water use, energy use, and then all the bad things happen too. CO2 in the atmosphere, the oceans acidifying, the surface temperature rising, the ozone growing, the methane growing in the atmosphere, the more land is taken over, the forests are destroyed, 
All that begins just 70 years ago. What began 70 years ago was what we now call the Anthropocene. So industrial capitalism has been ecocidal in terricidal in the literal sense. It has destroyed the natural bounty of Holocene nature. So the Anthropocene arrives with fossil fuels and coal and oil burning, which has led to CO2 rising from pre-industrial level of 280 parts per million to now 420 parts per million, which is the highest for 11 million years. This, of course, is what generates global warming, right? Because CO2 prevents the heat going back into the atmosphere. The density of particles stops the heat exiting. And of course, with that, we get fires. We get ecocidal flooding. We get the Anthropocene ecocide, we get the current rate of extinction of species, which is estimated at 100 to 1,000 times higher than the natural background extinction rates. We are in the midst of a sixth mass extinction. I mourn the Costa Rican golden frog, gone forever. I mourn the other species that we will never know. But it's ecocide, it's deforestation, air pollution, it's oil spill pollution. This is pictures from the disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. It's plastic pollution that is destroying our oceans. The United Nations Ocean Conference has estimated that the oceans might contain more weight in plastics than fish by the year 2050. And that might not be reversible. Ecocide produces eutrophication. This is too much nutrient spill-offs from fertilizer in the water. And what happens is the dying off of fish. Ecocide includes mining and mountaintop removal. Citizens who have undergone these things have said it's like living in a war zone. But look at the picture. A world without life. A world without life. Ecocide generates industrial agriculture, which destroys the soil, destroys the animals, and destroys every bit of nature as we know it. So, So my thought is simply this, here's my hypothesis. Is there really any doubt that industrial capitalism has been ecocidal? We are now facing a triple planetary crisis. Climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and waste all leading to the destruction of viable habitats everywhere. And as the Glasgow Climate Summit showed, blah, blah, blah. What is necessary now, what all sane people on the earth know, is we need an ecocide convention. We need the idea of ecocide 
to be on everyone's lips. We need a message that can say, you are killing the earth. This is not a matter of, of managing you know, some bad practices. This is a stopping of a continuous killing of living nature. And to make it a convention would try to send a message to corporations and states, enough, 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 whoops, I missed one, sorry. Let me see if I can get back, there we go. Now, law is a powerful, powerful tool. But law is only as good as the politics that support it. It is only as good as the politics that demand it. And it is only through activist radical politics of protest against ecocide that will let a truly earth conscience arise. A conscience of and for living nature that would make ecocide become visible as the crime it is. And it is this that etc. fights for, and it is this you will see majestically in the video you are about to witness. Thank you. Activismo, 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 activismo
Mi champingen, mapuche ta inche, inche mi love eh, piliama huizameu, eh, inche acun puel willy mapomeu. Soy de, o vengo de puel willy mapu, que es lo que hoy llaman Patagonia Argentina, del de centro sur de la Patagonia Argentina, de la provincia de Chubut. Soy de love mapuche piliama huiza y también fundadora y miembro del movimiento de mujeres indígenas por el buen vivir de Argentina. El origen se vio a partir de una caminata que empecé a hacer en el 2013, viajando por todo el país, caminando literalmente, también a veces a dedo, eh, llegaba a distintos territorios en conflicto y me reunía con las mujeres. Tenía la intención de poder generar eh, la primera marcha de mujeres originarias por buen vivir. En realidad nunca pensé que iba a derivar esto en un gran movimiento, pensé solo que íbamos a hacer una marcha para dar visibilidad a nuestra existencia y a nuestras demandas que eran seculares en relación a los hombres de, nuestro, de nuestros pueblos. Así que 36 naciones nos organizamos y salimos a marchar. La caminata fue contra el terricidio, tenía una consigna que era mientras no tengamos justicia para ellos no habrá paz. Están este, generando eh, terricidio y esta palabra terricidio había surgido a partir de un encuentro de, de todas nosotras las hermanas. Eh, hablamos de hermanas porque decimos que somos eh, humanes salidas de un mismo útero, entonces ahí hay una hermandad. Eh, no nos identifica la palabra compañero ni compañera, sino hermanes. Y que eh, se reflejaban en todas esas narrativas de dolor eh, muchos eh, elementos que están vi directamente vinculados a la colonización. Entonces decíamos, eh, no solamente se está perpetrando ecocidio, es decir, la forma de asesinar los ecosistemas, no solamente hay femicidio o, y feminicidios, eh, hay también eh, el asesinato de un modo de entender la vida diferente, ese epistemicidio, 
eh, están luchando, o sea, estamos luchando para preservar nuestra espiritualidad, encontramos esta palabra que sintetiza eh, terricidio, es la síntesis de los modos en que el sistema ha construido artilugios para la muerte. Eh, obviamente queremos eh, tratar de que la totalidad de las poblaciones, los dos pueblos del mundo puedan acompañar la demanda de que eh, se, el terricidio sea considerado un crimen de lesa humanidad y de lesa naturaleza, pero también al mismo tiempo somos conscientes de que los estados-nación son los eh, protagonistas de ese terricidio y encima pedimos que el terricidio eh, sea este, aplicado a los gobiernos, o sea, con los gobiernos terricidas, como así también las empresas terricidas puedan ser juzgadas y condenadas. Creemos que esto no va a suceder fácilmente porque eh, los, tanto los estados como las transnacionales, que en definitiva eh, los gobiernos del mundo eh, responden a esa corporocracia multinacional que opera en los territorios, no van a permitir eh, que se pueda aprobar un instrumento legal que les condene, que les ponga un límite, que le permita a los pueblos del mundo eh, obs observar, juzgar y condenar. Entonces creemos que por un lado hay que emplazarlo como agenda y caminar también a otras alternativas eh, de justicia desde los pueblos para un camino verdaderamente emancipatorio. Eh, así que es, eh, diríamos, una estrategia de visibilidad, de recuperación también de nuestro derecho a decidir eh, qué son crímenes y qué no, y, y también um, explorar nuestra capacidad propositiva para construir eh, alternativas o herramientas no solamente jurídicas, sino también de condena social. Por ejemplo, en el caso de las empresas, se los inhabilite de manera definitiva para que operen en territorio, es decir, que una vez que se comprobó que tal empresa ha provocado ecocidio, ha provocado también, porque se, se relaciona, porque lo más importante del terricidio es el ensamble de la vida que deja expuesto el terricidio, eh, los ecocidios, los epistemicidios, todo, todo es parte de un mega gran proyecto que es el extractivismo. Uh -huh. Fede and Loreto, you know, we've seen these wonderful videos and we've learned about ecocide and uh, we're starting to learn about your body of work internationally and I'm just hoping to start this off. Uh, if you could just sort of contextualize this overall project around ecocide. This is chapter two. You're working with Vera List and the Boris Lurie you know, Foundation, et cetera, um, et cetera. You know, um, maybe you can just give us a little more context of how it's structured this way. Yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> now, first of all, I would say uh, thanks uh, for Veravis Foundation, for all the people that is organizing this event, for CEC, it's like Our that, links. Our links. Uh, also to bring us here. I want to thank also Moira Millan, who was super kind to give us that fantastic interview that we are showing like in a little version, and to you too, to come here. And now Federico can answer the first question. <laughs> and to all of you for being here uh, inside doors. <laughs> well, thank you, Larry, thank you very much. Yes, it's a pleasure to share this moment with you since we know each other for a long time. And do it here in New York City, no? Yeah. Finally. <laughs> so, well, yes, I mean, to introduce a little bit the program, the, the concept, the general concept of this program, when we started, I mean, uh, to imagine this proposal for, for the Boris Lorry uh, Beralist Center Fellowship, the first idea was try to establish a dialogue, a global dialogue, but especially from the south to the north and vice versa, uh, and in order to analyze and to try to understand how these questions, these topics, these urgent questions are affecting the entire world and not only our southern societies. Even if we come from Argentina, she's from Chile, I'm from Argentina, one of the epicenters of, of ecocide. Um, 
for us was important to divide the, the, the project, the research in different chapters, to go through the, the topics, the most important topic we found for this, which are the neo-extractivist model, extractivism, no extractivism, but extractivism, the policies of extraction, which include not only the mining, but, but as well the uses of GMO, and well, all what she detailed very well in, in the fantastic presentation he did. So uh, basically, we coming from a background of making art in the in not only in the institutions but in the street, no, in the protest related with the social movements. And for a long time, we were close to movement of human rights. So time ago, we start a kind of journey from the human right to the to the <laughs> defending the rights of the nature and other species, no? So we choose two or three or four topics for, for this program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, you have like, there is, this is chapter two, chapter. and there's different, what are the other chapters? Like, how is this going, what's the shape of this now? Yes, the first chapter, it was yeah. about uh, pure to understand what is the term of neo uh -huh. which is a new term. Uh, that was developed in the, in the south of South America uh, because we know, everybody knows what is coming, the, the extractivist term, even all the colonization of South America and Africa is coming because extractivist reasons and capitalist system is coming from extractivists, from miners in Potosí, in Bolivia, no? Uh, so, that we really wanted to understand how was this new process of extractivism that arrived 10 years or more than 10 years ago, again, to the south, to the southern countries. We wanted to understand also which companies were, are part of this new process of extraction and which countries are, or states are also part of this new, new way of extraction and why in our territories it's so easily to go and, 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 start and, to exploit. and, and, yeah. and start to exploit things that in several countries, like European countries, are impossible to exploit, like fracking or certain kind of mining and, and things like that. So we, must, we, we did a long-term research before uh, Vera Lee's uh, fellowship uh, about the extractivist model. But we wanted to, to introduce uh, or research in Vera Liz, starting with this term of neo extractivism. So we invite Eduardo Gudinas, which is an Uruguayan theorist, uh, environmentalist too. And he is one of the, there are a lot of, of other South American theorists that introduced this term. Which is very interesting because it's uh, it's not it's a, it's a concept that involves policies of extractivism, but not only uh, thinking in this kind of uh, right wing capitalist uh, mm -hmm. governments. It's also involved in this new progressive government that need to be involved in these extraction policies mm -hmm. because uh, the deep crisis economic as poor countries had and. Debts with F FMI and international banks and things like that. So we, we, we create the first chapter about neo extractivists. The second chapter is ecocide. And the third chapter is about when we live, which is a concept that for us it was important to introduce because it's a long term discussion in, in our countries about which kind of system could, could exist after capitalist system or after this development hyper-developed societies uh, exist in our country, how we can create some kind of balance, how humanity can live in balance with other uh, beings, and also how humanity can be in balance, live in balance, or the societies can build economically and culturally uh, in balance with the nature. Right. So basically there are the three, uh, three chapters, and the final chapter will be the next year, uh, we think around May, mm -hmm. and we expect to, to finish this process with uh, some kind of final result of everything in, a, in different forms, like interventions, exhibition, 
performance. So the three chapters are the first, uh, uh, neo-extractivism, second, ecocide, which are the consequence, and buen vivir as a kind of potential solution. But we invite you because we really wanted to talk about the use of the body in mm -hmm. this resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, we are coming from the performative art, and, 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 and what we realized, why we also engage as an artist, it was not only because we feel really uh, touched by the, the history of the mothers of, 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 of Barrito Sango, who were resisting Monsanto there in, in, in Argentina mm -hmm. in a time. So, but for us, it was how this resistance against ecocide, against extractivism, uh, it's really a resistance that need to have the body in the territories. Yes. Uh, to resist a Monsanto plant, the people have to be there in the body. And, and, and we really discovered that it was huge social, environmental imagination growing mm -hmm. in these uh, struggles that are in different points of, in Latin America, but also here in, in, in America too. So we invite you because we know that you were yeah. you was involved in, in, in sure in the north, in the heart of the empire, <laughs> right? The so where it's an interesting relationship as we have a dialogue between north and south and asking these questions because of course the climate disaster doesn't have boundaries, right? Oh. It's for everybody to enjoy uh, the destruction, right? And then here we are in, in in the heart of the empire where a lot of these headquarters of these corporations are. So you, it's a problem and it's an opportunity <laughs> to go to their headquarters and do creative things. And uh, I think that's been, that's been interesting, taking leads. I think the, the social movements have been inspired by the South and by, by your work and other, other people's work. Here in the North, we're kind of, uh, for years and decades, have taken the uh, inspiration, that we, the lead from the South, and then said, oh, wow, we better catch up and start doing things, right? And, um, and, and here, of course, they have, uh, um, there's incredible performances happening based in the North. And I refer, in this case, to the performance of corporations uh, to confuse, or, uh, confuse the conversation around climate disaster or climate science or the reality that we can feel on our own skin as the climate becomes more unstable. They're still sowing seeds of doubt with cultural work. I would, I would call it cultural work that the corporations are so, doing. So, so maybe you can tell us, and, and to the audience, no? which kind of uh, uh, experiments or strategies or tactics yeah. you find interesting uh, in order to, to, to sure. fight this. I mean, I, you know, it, it's similar to work done around the world, but here it's an attempt to use what I would refer to as tactical performance, right? So this can include uh, blockades, but creative blockades, uh, creative campaigns that are sort of mediagenic pranks uh, or actions. And I have a, actually have, could you have an example that's very high tech here. Um, you know, like this is, a, this is an action that uh, I participated in outside of the world headquarters of, of Wells Fargo. And of course, Wells Fargo is a major investment bank and they're invested very much in, in fossil fuels, et cetera. And, um, I have to watch when I say et cetera because I'm referring to you now. When I'm saying it, <laughs> really, um, but this is an example. So I've I've worked with people blockading the headquarters, and of course, you want to uh, fairly represent the perspective of the CEO of the company if he's not nice enough to come to your protest to talk, and he didn't come. So I spoke up, and if we can get a little close up of here, I, I showed up at the protest with something that looked more or less like this. And this is an explanation speaking f on behalf of Wells Fargo who uh, at, the, at the demonstration. And as you can see, their fossil fuels plan, they're tracking how fires are going up. This is a very sophisticated chart. Of course, floods are going up. We can see that, that profits are going up. There's a problem, popular rebellions are also going up. So what is the plan, of course, is your question. You've got our money, it's driving profits, all of these things are happening, but what's the long-term investment plan for this corporation? You'd wanna know, and I'm glad you asked because we have an answer here. And of course, there's a very large spaceship that the CEOs are going to go on, fueled by the money, and it's, the ship is going to planet B. A lot of people say there is no planet B, but no, there is one. And the CEOs <laughs> plan to go there. 
And we understand that the, the sort of the sunsets on the beaches on the methane oceans are just spectacular. So we're looking forward to that. But of course, your question will be, well, what happens to you, the regular person? And that's a fair question. And of course, this is a paper point presentation, by the way. This is very, very high tech, high budget, sponsored by Wells Fargo. And of course, the answer is, for you, you have a choice to just be here on fire or underwater because we do believe in you know, customer choice and consumer choice. You can choose between those two fates. Anyway, this is the kind of presentation you would do at a demonstration to entertain people who are blocking the door in the cold for hours and hours. You want to make them laugh a little bit, obviously. Make a point. Maybe passersby get an idea what's happening. Maybe it's a little bit mediogetic. You earn a little media. Do you mind if I do this one more real quick? This is fast. Okay. This was, um, so my first day, I go by L.M. Bogad for whatever reason of my life. But, you know, I, I go by Larry Thornton. And this is the kind of thing I'm doing in my Guggenheim Fellowship, by the way. So um, the project I'm doing is called Disastrous Theatrics, Cultural Conflict and Climate Change. And so this is another example of very dignified work. Uh, uh, BlackRock has a wonderful headquarters here in, in New York. And during their annual shareholder meeting a few years ago, you know, his, 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 that CEO's name is Larry. You can look that up. And mine is too. So I just stood outside in, in, a, in a nicer suit than what I'm wearing now as Larry, not lying technically. And me and my uh, besuited colleagues were giving out an improved version of the shareholder statement as Larry giving it to people saying, ask questions inside. I just had a brainstorm. This is the actual text of the thing they were getting. We gave it to all the shareholders as if we were really them. But what if he suddenly realized, you know, wow, fossil fuels, climate disaster, mass extinction, bad for profits. Do you know what I mean? Like this is, he's just thinking about it rationally. And we gave this out to everyone going in and said, please ask questions inside. But inspired by examples of work like yours, of course, we had an indigenous activists in the shareholders meeting using shock shareholders proxies that they legally had to ask the serious questions. We disrupted with this kind of playful intervention and then opened it up for the, I would say, the smart people inside to, to cause the serious trouble inside. So anyway, this is the kind of action we're trying to, to do to leverage. It's almost like the performance is a crowbar. We don't have that much force to change policy, so we try to use this kind of action as a little bit of a conceptual crowbar to force an opening, you know, that kind of thing. So, I, which, which actually leads me to ask you all a question, because I watched the videos before, and I watched them, I really love the work you're doing, and I saw your, and I just think this is interesting, you, I know of your work in human rights, of course, and, and uh, after the repression uh, in, in, in South America, and, uh, and I followed that, and then I'm seeing you dressed as a corn, which I think is really interesting, and speaking to the Mapuche uh, woman activist, and, and we talked a little bit about your, your shift there uh, to environmental concerns. And I'm wondering, is there any, you were starting to talk about that evolution. And I don't know if you have anything else to say about, about that evolution. You were beginning to talk about it before. It was a counter-revolution. <laughs> no. No. Well, well, yes, I don't know if you want to go first. No, 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 you, you. Well, I mean, we can choose carrot, potato, but corn. So, well, Argentina is a big exportator of corn. It's, um, I mean, but of course, when I mean, the first time we start to we we discover how to feel, how to be a corn, uh, was a strange, strange sensation, because well, at the, at the early beginning. Um, we understood that, of course, transgenic food in Argentina was growing a lot, and. As you saw in the video, the power of Monsanto today, Bayer, no? Bayer company, mm -hmm. uh, was so big. And then, well, it was a time when, when we were traveling around the world, like we did before COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a big exhibition in Germany, look at them by chance, we met two persons from Argentina, two women. And okay, we were in a talk about farming and farmers and agriculture and so on. And they say, okay, are you from Argentina? We are from Argentina. What we are doing here in Sherman, in Kassel, in Documenta, we are artists. <laughs> they are not. <laughs> but, but, but they say, okay, we, we are here. And so when they start to tell us about the disaster, I mean, we feel very ignorant. It's our own country, the province of Cordoba, not so far away from Buenos Aires. So. But we are in the town, in the city, and that time we didn't got that the Monsanto spraying of glyphosate, I mean the combination, which is called Roundup. Roundup technology is the seed plus the poison. 
So this is a full package. They sell you everything. And you have to renew. You have to pay every single year to have the seeds, no? Yeah. You cannot distribute like before. So that was uh, something we know from the uh, political and economical point of view. But we never expect such damage in the health and nature. For example, Sofia Gatica, one of those women, she, she told us that of course, she had problems in the family because the spraying was through the water and, and the air and everything, and the family started to get sick, the, mm -hmm. the, the sun, and then the ice, and so on. So then we understood that it's a problem of human rights, no? Because it's the violation of the right of the people to exist and to live. But with the pretext or the, the reason of the in economically make increasing the economy of the country, no? save the, the problems of the country, the debt, no? the needs. How? By producing more um, transgenic food and mm -hmm. um, commodities. The idea is exportation. It's not to feed our people. No, yeah. it's to export. So then magically we become... Con no, then <laughs> we... We, it's possible, everything. We, we were talking to them and said, okay, when you go to Buenos Aires, when you all be there, we should make an appointment and come to Cordoba. Don't stay in Buenos Aires. Come to see with your own eyes and, and maybe you can help us. During that time, we were human beings. Did not corn. Okay. Not corn. Not yet. But then, of course, we asked them, what, what can we do? They said, we are running a festival, which is uh, Primavera sin Monsanto, springtime without... Monsanto, just to, to, in order to make Monsanto factory, was one of the first factory producing transgenic seeds, uh, go out from Argentina. For us, was very ambitious, like, sounds like impossible, but it happens at the end. So they start to make blockades and, and protest in front of the, of the company. Company didn't pay attention, but they streamed the methodology of making, putting the body directly in the, Highway and cutting the highway and so on. Had problem with the police and was a little bit criminalized also by the mass media because in the mainstream media they say the only way to recover the economy of Argentina is produce and sell our commodities. Mm -hmm. So why why do you want Monsanto to go out? And this also is the, the people, logic of neoliberal uh, and capital. the people from their own town. When we met to the, went to the protest, many people was against the protest because they say I need to keep my shop. Yeah. Can you imagine what? Yeah. So then they say, okay, but you are artists, so maybe you can help us with the childrens. We don't know why they say that, but because we have a lot of children from their family, yeah. and during the festival we need to do something with them. Sure. So keep them, make some entertainment, entertain, you know, another industry, <laughs> Not specifically contemporary art, but. <laughs> so then we say how we can keep the, the kids playing, no, or doing something while we make the demonstration and so on. So that was the moment when we decided to make the costumes and, and first the first experiment was not with ourselves, was with the kids, as usual. Very no? nice. You know the infantry, the army is composed of <laughs> infant yeah. infantry. So always in the first line, mm. are not the oldest, but yes, the youngest. We, we made some sure. kind of competition plays for the kids. Uh -huh. So someone will dress in this white stuff, throwing poisoning, and the other one will uh -huh. be the corn poisoning. Uh -huh. So it was very funny because in <laughs> <Yeah>. the beginning, <laughs> when we asked the kid, okay, which uh, which kind of uh, yeah. costume you want to use? Like which team do you All want to be? All of them, they the want team. to be the poison. The, yeah, in the hazmat they, want, they want yeah. to be the bad yeah, one. Yeah, it's more fun. Then <laughs> was one of them without dress because it was more kids uh, than you had than costumes. Than the costumes. Sure. So he had to be the corn, and he arrived there, and he saw Federico dresses as corn with uh, very nice sunglasses, yeah. like Ray-Ban sunglasses, yeah. and he was like. Uh, he's cool. I will be. Cool. I will be the only corn. Nice. And then all the kids, because he said I will be the only corn, become corn. Yes. And nobody want to be yes. glyphosate or stuff. But so it was very funny. It was very nice experience. The idea was to teach or to be. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> didactic. Didactic. Mm -hmm. No, try to. But at the end, we was easier than we expect because. At the beginning, no one wanted to be corn, and at the end, 
Well, corn, but, but corn was cool. Corn, but the problem, corn, corn is cool, but the problem is, 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 a, is a transgenic corn or not? Right. We don't know that yet. But mm. what, what, we, what we really understood the with, the, with the corn custom yeah. is that, uh, for example, now there is a big movement of farmers that they are doing amazing things there in, in Argentina. It's a huge uh, movement of farmers that are changing completely the agriculture there in a very good way. And also they are really changing the structure of how in, in urban cities we eat uh, organic food because they, they, they really are really teaching also this industry of organic and bio because they are saying, okay, to be bio and to have organic food, you don't need to be expensive. Mm -hmm. So they are doing it in a very social and popular way, in a right. super good way. Yeah. So they intervene some sometimes the train, the big main uh, train stations where the worker class uh, go into the city and they give in a very, very cheap prices this organic amazing food they are doing and they are doing also medicines and things like that so they asked us uh, they saw us we interviewed them for the first chapter and they saw the corn dresses and they asked okay can we have two of these dresses we said of, of course we give off our corn customs and they started to use in their demonstration so now they call us can we have more Mm -hmm. And one and one of the things that we realized in this relation between uh, how to develop uh, change also in a symbolical way, uh, I don't know if you saw in the in the interview of Moira Millan, she talked about the, this ter terricide as also as a kind of way of killing uh, other ways of thinking. Uh, she talk about Epis epistemicidio, uh, epistemicidio, no? Yeah, that, yeah. Epistemicide. Sure. Epistemicide. Sure. So uh, what we are discovering with these dresses of corn, which are very funny and very bad done, <laughs> very bad done, uh, is that when you use uh, that, you immediately became, became a, a corn. corn. Yeah. And the people love you, especially in South America, and I imagine also in other countries like Turkey, it, it will be the same because mm -hmm. the corn, it's so important for our culture, right. right? You know, and then it becomes and a symbol of resistance. It's so important for the uh, uh, people that came from native uh, nations right. because the corn, it was in the big part of the history of South America and I think North America too. It was the beginning of the humanity. You mm. know, it's, uh, it's not like Catholic uh, to come from the. It's no, not. No, it's you not. come from corn. Right. So it was. And, and we discovered that the that dresses are amazing and they are super cool. Right? Yes. And they are super, cool. <laughs> super cool. It's very trendy now. And to don't, be a corn. Don't, don't call them but because maybe they will appear. That's right. They <laughs> might very well. Don't call them because maybe. You, that, is, that, is that foreshadowing? Okay. Um, yeah. And I, uh, I, I wanted to ask you, get, you know, something about that I, that I like a lot, but I want you to kind of get into it. I've heard you refer to John Cage and this idea of response. Ability, as opposed to responsibility, responsibility, and then I'm like, well, why are you so interested in this like postmodern, you know, artist, you know, composer? What is that? How does that connect with your ideas of resistance and creative resistance? Well, at the early beginning, we were trying to 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 keep in silence for four minutes thirty three seconds, as a quotation of Sean Sean Just, Cage, but yeah. we will make the people so boring. And well, this is live streaming and people listening. So four, <laughs> four minutes, thirty-three seconds of silence. Sure. sure. So sure. then we understood that 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 in in. By the way, it's also really hard for us to stay quiet for that long. I don't think we can do it. Okay. No. Well, we we. I mean, the need of be able to respond. No. The the responsibility. We had to play on that way. And when we saw that Sean Cage used this concept time ago. It's always important in contemporary art to quote, no? Yeah, a bit. So the fetish of the footnote. In yeah. 1957, uh, he chose to use this word, shifting the emphasis from an ethic of accountability to an aesthetic of engagement. Yeah. That is the full quotation. Very nice. And we understood that yes, <laughs> what is a, 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 what mean an aesthetic of engagement? Perhaps what we are doing, sure. no? Sure. And uh, I think of accountability <laughs> yeah. is what we described it before. So uh, we thought that perhaps the only way to make this manifesto alive yeah. is, is 
is talking about who had the responsibility and exactly. who is able to respond. I that's think that's great because there's such a talk about how we're individually responsible and that's a game. That's the game that the corporations are playing. That, you know, I think we could talk about who's really responsible. Yeah? Excuse us. Hmm. I can. You're going to have a little moment now as a change occurs. Dun, 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 dun. You all look fine here tonight. Dun, 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 dun. That was a great presentation. Thank you, sir. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Who is responsible? Right. If we all recycle every day, that's fabulous. And of course, the US military is the biggest polluter in the world. If we don't change that, we can recycle all we want. I mean recycle, I'm not trying to be obnoxious. You know. I'm also vamping for time for the transformation that's occurring. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So happy. Flanked by corn. Mm. One step. Oh, yes. Of course. Yes. You tell us how we look. Composition. Good. Composition is okay? Yes. Some question from the audience there around the world. So, well, mm -hmm. we go Let's ahead. Start. Okay. Please. Manifiesto sobre el ecocidio. The Responsibility Ecocide Manifesto. Uno, el ecocidio es un crimen contra la naturaleza de la tierra, perpetuado por un grupo de humanos, pero no por toda la humanidad. Ecocide is a crime against the earth, committed by certain specific humans and not by all of humankind. Dos, nosotros... No aceptaremos la responsabilidad del daño socioambiental producido por multinacionales. We individual people on the earth do not expect accept responsibility for the socio-environmental damage caused by the multinational corporations. Tres, para contrarrestar la violencia colonial del neoextractivismo, emergerán acciones basadas en la habilidad de respuesta y la imaginación socioambiental. To counteract the colonial violence of neo-extractivism, actions will emerge with response ability and socio-environmental imagination. Cuatro. Nuestras semillas germinarán el buen vivir. Our collective seeds will germinate buen vivir, the right way of living, sustainable living. Cinco. Nuestros cuerpos serán las piedras por donde se filtrará el agua. Our bodies will be the stones through which water is filtered. 6. La naturaleza no se equivoca. Se defiende y se transforma. Errar humanum est. Nature is not wrong. It defends itself and transforms itself. Errar humanum est. It is human to err. 7. Y ahora sí. Podemos comenzar diciendo las cosas por su nombre. We can start now by saying the specific names of the specific perpetrators. Basf. Bayer. Monsanto. Singenta. Unilever. ExxonMobil. Gazprom. National Iranian Oil. Total. Coal India. Petrobras. Abu Dhabi Oil. PetroChina, Saudi Aramco, <laughs> Pemex, Sonatrach, Chevron, Texpetroil, Pan American Energy, Halliburton, BBB, Shell, Baker Hughes, and, and Schlumberger, Barry Gold, <laughs> Pan American Silver, Shell. 
Thank you all for witnessing this historical moment with us. Um, there are a few questions that are maybe in this room, but certainly on the internet as well. So could I ask maybe, um, Ariola, can you collect a few? Would Are there uh, questions in the room here? Would you like to join us just for a little closing reflection? Okay. That would be lovely. And Jay, and we need another chair here, please. Being the, this being the, um, I think, some of the concluding event of the CEC Arts Link Assembly. So um, it might be lovely just to reflect for a few minutes and then we must bid you goodbye on these different kinds of discourse that we witnessed just now. And I thought it was really, really poignant how every presenter this afternoon was so efficient and so effective and had so, so much to say in their own voice and their own language and starting with you Jay, I mean it was an absolutely superb um, uh, manifesto in mm -hmm. itself you know, for what needs to be done and then this soft transition thanks to you <laughs> Larry um, from one professor to the next and then to the artists so I'd like to hear from you maybe even just closing remarks what does it feel like for you to to come at the end of, an, of um, presentations as we've witnessed and be the artists, you know, who dress up in corn, a costume that, you know, first the, the kids modeled and have the last word and see the scale of the problem and the interventions assuming such different roles, you know, from a scholarly academic um, expose that is, leads to an entire book to this performance in a conference room for you know a small live audience and a vast audience online maybe could you share a little bit uh, your experience uh, with us i mean we're still on the experience <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are not, uh, but, uh, but you're human again yes, we're yes, human yes, again yes half human but now i became a little less human <laughs> uh, no post-human no post-human <laughs> yeah. right. well so they did promise the next time we're together that I shall be corn too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. As, yes. As, as is important. Yes, thank you. Um, it, it matters to me and I think uh, to my friends that there not be a gap mm -hmm. between the academic mm -hmm. and the performative. Mm -hmm. To imagine that is to take us back to a time before there was ecocide before we were all placed together in a condition we did not make, but will make us and our children and our children's children, right? So we are responding to the same level of, of threat, of terror, but also, and this is, seems to me what we try to rehearse together, you know, so we all dress together, <laughs> organize, very important. No, it creates a collective. That the difficulty creates our being together and creates the possibility and the necessity of conversation so that we learn the necessity right, of, of sharing uh, 
good living together. Exactly. Yeah. I think also what you just said about being together, you know, it speaks to what you said earlier, that we enact these roles, and you describe it so beautifully, what happens when you put on this, forgive me, this ridiculous costume, yeah. that you do, you <laughs> do, do it, do it, we you love really become, cool. <laughs> you do become it to some extent, so the need to have the individual body commit to, to the fight, yes, so I, it's I would really say important that, and shared by all of you. Yes, I said we are coming from very long tradition, I think in, in Argentina it's a very long tradition, I, and I think here everywhere, no, like, mm -hmm. Uh, the social movements and even the anti-global social movement 20 years, more than 20 years ago, we shared something in common that it was like this idea of, of course, if we, if we have to imagine another society which is not this, we have to make an effort together mm -hmm. of change, mm -hmm. of, of, of think about what is imagination, what is the social imagination, what is, what is next? Because to imagine another society, you need to make a big effort like the artists do, or like we talk with, even with lawyers, we have yep. many good friends, lawyers, that they said, we are like you. We have to invent several things to, to win a human right uh, right. trial. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you have to invent, for example, if, if you are a lawyer and you have to put, uh, put uh, in a trial, uh, for example, the condition of being disappeared by a drone mm -hmm. without any person responsible, you have to invent something. And we, the artists, I think all the artists, but especially the artists who, 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 who have been part of the social movements as one more of the social movements, we often talk with people which is coming from biologists, scientists, lawyers, uh, Farmers, you have people, different people, because you, as you said, we are part of a collective at the end, because we, we wanted to change something. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's always a, an, a collective exercise. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, of course, we always, from the beginning, as etc., from 97, we used to play a lot of humor, grotesque, and even the surrealist uh, way of doing, because we also felt that. Uh, the system we want to change, you know, in the one we are struggling, uh, it's a system that plays in a very sophisticated way, like, uh, for example, advertising, and even for us, like, we always said, like, Federico, I love when Federico presents himself in some kind of seminars when he said, like, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a theater performer playing as a visual artist. So it's very nice when you, you, you can change that condition as, and a stereotype. So I think for me the cons for us, uh, it, it was the only way to, to entering into such a movement that we were not part, for example. We were not ecological people. We come more from social, soci, social movement, and then we understand how important it was to keep uh, this environmental I want to add only just uh, uh, to talk about serious issues, sometimes you have to do uh, fa uh, yeah. funny or, or humoristic things. I would even I say sometimes think. you have to take a situation seriously enough yes. to be ridiculous. Yes. And, that, and it's not trivializing if you're yeah. working hard at it, it's actually hard work yeah. and you're, yeah. it's dire. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. And it's functioning because even when you want to be attractive or you want to be as a social movement, yeah. you need to have something which is not, because politics is very serious. Yeah. Of course, yeah. we are talking yeah. about something super serious when you are involved in political uh, struggles. But you need to have some kind, something that the people will join you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Inviting, yeah. inviting, yeah. as you said. And, and he also, and I think it's a very important aspect of your work now, is you have to, as a social movement, show what you're for. Mm -hmm. oh, of course you have to show what you're against, but you know, a lot of people know. Mm -hmm. They know, people aren't completely lost, you know, they know, but then it's like, well, now what? Yeah. And to be able, as you're doing, to provide, mm -hmm. okay, well, let's move towards William VD or something yes. that's... But at, at the end of your presentation, what I really, well, I mean, it's all of that, but yeah. I really appreciate it that there is an exit, there is a place to go, I mean, mm -hmm. fighting, protesting, and so on, it's not like describing a description of the of the problem and that's all no we have to fight for that and mm -hmm. every single moment is important create consciousness and push yeah. the no yeah. 
not only that, but but to underline what you said so beautifully, it's a moment of invention. The very concept of ecosci is an invention. And unless we understand that even law has to invent, even politics has to invent. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if the business of invention mm -hmm. is done in the artist's studio and the rest of us can carry on. Invention is the necessity of inhabiting the present. Mm -hmm. Which ties us back very, very lo lovely to the, con to the the subject of this entire assembly, which is dedicated to future fellows. And mm. of course, we, you, are really enacting and embodying a future for all of us. So um, maybe with that, I just want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank you for your incredibly important work. Thank you very much. All four of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.